The Radio Memories Network is brought to you in part by Liberated Syndication, podcast publishing made easy, Libsyn.com. That's L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. The best old-time radio from people you trust. The Radio Nostalgia Network, where the oldies are still young. Let us now visit the newsroom for this week's historical reporting. This is John Daly at Convention Hall, Richmond, Virginia. On this 25th day of June, 1788, the Virginia Ratifying Convention has been taken completely by surprise. Mr. Edmund Randolph, present governor of Virginia, has come out publicly in favor of the proposed federal constitution for the United States of America. As a delegate to this crucial convention, and up to now an avowed enemy of the constitution, Governor Randolph has been a leader in the campaign against ratification. But he has just told reporters that he will speak and vote for ratification when the convention reconvenes to vote a few minutes from now. Thus, the Constitution, which would unite the 13 American states under a strong central government, has found a powerful friend in an unexpected quarter. June 25th, 1788, the Convention Hall, Richmond, Virginia. You are there. Virginia, key state in the plan to form the 13 original states into a united America, stands undecided, torn by dissension, and the Constitution hangs in the balance. CBS takes you back 160 years to the day that determined whether Americans could go forward from revolution and establish a stable central government. All things are as they were then, except for one thing. When CBS is there, you are there. You Are There, produced and directed by Robert Louis Cheon, is based on authentic historical facts and quotation. And now, Virginia, the Richmond Convention Hall, and John Daly. ...for a group of reporters hurriedly summoned to the governor's executive chamber a few minutes ago. Asked why he is turning from the party of Patrick Henry to the party of James Madison, Governor Randolph would not amplify his statements, saying only that he will give the reasons which prompted his move on the floor of the convention. And we hurried from that news conference to this microphone here on the convention floor to bring you this news. There's Mr. James Monroe, one of Mr. Patrick Henry's chief lieutenants, in the fight against ratification. Mr. Monroe. Sir. Sir, are you aware that Governor Randolph has gone over to the Federalist Party? I am indeed. Uh, Would you care to comment on it, Mr. Monroe? Any remarks on Governor Randolph's strange conduct will come from Mr. Henry, the leader of our party. But how do you think Governor Randolph's action will uh, affect the vote on ratification, sir? No comment, sir. No comment. Mr. Monroe has turned away from the microphone. Our brief conversation, a mark of the confusion Governor Randolph's change of mind has produced here. Ned Calmer has been analyzing the possibilities inherent in Governor Randolph's action and is ready now with his report. So over to our CBS headquarters booth here in Convention Hall and Ned Calmer. Governor Randolph's sudden allegiance to the Federalists may have a decisive effect on this convention. Roughly half of the delegates represent the cities, towns, and the tidewater planters, and the other half come from the rural districts. Generally speaking, the planters and the businessmen are in favor of a national constitution. They are haunted by memories of Daniel Shea's rebellion in Massachusetts last year, and they want the constitution as an instrument to end social chaos. On the other hand, the rural delegates, by and large, oppose the constitution. At present, they're paying their debts with cheap state paper money, and they fear that national currency reforms would work to their disadvantage. But Governor Randolph has much influence and prestige among the country delegates. His change of position may very well swing the necessary votes from among them to carry the ratification. Thus, what happens here in Virginia today may decide the destiny of America. As you know, nine states must ratify the proposed Constitution if it's to supplant the Articles of Confederation. Eight states have already ratified, and four others probably will not. If Virginia fails to ratify, the Constitution is likely to be doomed. And in that case, just a moment, Governor Randolph, at his executive mansion, has consented to grant our reporter, Don Hollenbeck, a brief interview before departing for this convention hall. So over to Don Hollenbeck at the governor's mansion. Governor Randolph, sir, will you tell us why you've made this last-minute turn from the anti-Constitution Party to the Federalists? I have joined the Federalists because the anti-Constitution Party has caused too much, far too much delay on the pressing issue of a strong central government. Why do you feel that we need a strong central government such as the proposed Constitution outlines? It is imperative. 
The union of the state sags apart for want of it. Mr. Henry fails to see the danger. He occupies himself with legalistic assaults on various phases of the Constitution without realizing that the measure as a whole is desperately needed. Well, Governor, do you endorse the proposed Constitution in toto without amendments? No, I do not. I hope and trust that certain amendments will subsequently be adopted, such as um, a Bill of Rights and um, a clause absolutely forbidding the importation of Negro slaves. But all that can come later. Time is running out, and we cannot go on under the Articles of Confederation. Thank you, Governor Randolph. This is Don Hollenbeck returning you now to John Daly on the floor of Convention Hall. About 80 delegates are here now, and among them is Mr. Patrick Henry, former governor of Virginia, leader of the Anti-Constitution Party. He's wearing the ill-fitting wig and chevy black coat for which he is famous, and his hawk-like face is grim and forbidding. Mr. Henry! Sir, would you care to comment on Governor Randolph's repudiation of the Anti-Constitution Party? Governor Randolph, bah! My opponents are welcome to him. He, like they, has turned his back on the revolution. He's divorced himself from the common people and embrace that hydra-headed monster property. Well, do you mean to suggest, sir, that the Constitution favors the property-holding classes of the nation? Yes. May I charge you? The worship of private property is implicit in every article of that infamous document. One year ago, sir, at Philadelphia, the Constitution stank so noisomely that Governor Randolph refused to sign it. Does it smell any sweeter now? No. The Constitution remains unchanged. It is Edmund Randolph who has changed. Randolph. An empty sail billowing with the wind from the tidewater. Are you implying, Mr. Henry, that Governor Randolph has yielded to pressure from the tidewater plantation? No, no. Randolph was born with a golden spoon in his mouth. He is rich. He has many slaves. He is also a politician, and as such, he flirted briefly with the ideas of liberty and equality. <laughs> but the governor has seen the light. Property is the thing that counts. Well, wouldn't you say, sir, that the protection of private property is important for the welfare of the country? Important, yes. But human rights are equally important. And where, I ask you, where do you find one single mention of human rights in this Constitution that we are asked to ratify today? But if that is so, Mr. Henry, how do you explain that eight states have already ratified the Constitution? Citizens of those eight states would bargain away their heritage of freedom for a mess of pot. For my part, give me liberty. Greatest of all earthly blessings. Give me that precious jewel, and you may take everything else. Thank you, Mr. Henry. Here comes Mr. Madison. He's a small man and quiet of voice, but Mr. Madison yields to no man in intellectual capacity. Indeed, he is as famous for the logic of his arguments as Mr. Patrick Henry is for the brilliance of his oratory. Mr. Madison! Mr. Madison, Mr. Henry has just charged that the Constitution places property rights above human rights. An interesting phrase. But then Patrick Henry is a master of interesting phrases. One of them helped to start our revolution. The trouble is, Mr. Henry is in a constant state of revolution. He should remember that the war is over and that his antagonists in the ho this hall are not redcoats. Yes, Mr. Madison, but uh, what about his argument, sir? Ah, yes. Uh, property rights above human rights. Well, now, suppose we examine that without the benefit of oratory, shall we? Mr. Henry would give you the impression that this is a struggle between the rich and the poor, the strong and the weak. The fact is, sir, that there are wealthy men who hate the Constitution and poor men who love it. The point is that all Americans, rich and poor, are in dire straits today because we have no strong central government. Mr. Henry poses as the shining knight of liberty. But where, sir, is liberty without order? Order is what we need, not at the expense of human rights, but precisely to render them secure. Well, Mr. Madison, it's been reported that Mr. Thomas Jefferson, our ambassador to France, is against the Constitution. That, sir, is a distortion. Mr. Jefferson is a friend of mine. I'm in constant correspondence with him. It is true that he disagrees with some aspects of the Constitution, but on the whole, he favors it. As a matter of fact, it would be well for Mr. Henry to remember there are other patriots of the War for Independence who stand behind the Constitution. Not only Thomas Jefferson... But General Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, John Dickinson, and a host of others. Thank you, Mr. Madison. A pleasure, sir. Well, you've heard that the Constitution would be of great benefit to all Americans, and you've also heard that it will benefit only the rich. Outside this Virginia Hall, there's a representative crowd waiting for the result of the vote, and Ken Roberts is out there. So let's switch to him and find out... 
how these people feel about the Constitution. Go ahead, Ken Roberts. In this crowd, judging by their dress, are people from every section and class of Virginia. I see men who are obviously planters, others who must be tradesmen, and a large number of farming folks. Some of them must have come a long way to be in Richmond at this fateful hour. Here, for instance, is a tall man wearing a fringed shirt and a coonskin cap. Where are you from, sir? I be from Pineville, in the western district. You're a delegate, sir? Nay. I come here to watch all the delegates. Oh? Uh, I want to be sure they vote the way they're supposed to. And, uh... How are the delegates in the Western District supposed to vote, Mr. Uh, uh, Holloway, Thomas Holloway, and they're still supposed to vote against the Constitution when Governor Randolph will be paying for turning his court on us come next election. Uh, would you mind telling us why you're against the Constitution, Mr. Holloway? See this bullet wound in my left arm? I received it ten years ago, from September. I received it fighting to free Virginia from the rule of King George. Don't you mean that you were fighting to free the United States? Nay, to free Virginia. But aren't you a citizen of the United States? Nay, I'm a citizen of Virginia. We fought to be rid of the third George, and we want no fourth to take his place. Then you think the Constitution would result in a king being imposed on the American states? Aye. What makes you think so? If there be a Constitution, there'll be a president. If there be a president, he'll waste no time making himself into a monarch. But, uh, Mr. Holloway, it's generally agreed that if the Constitution is ratified, the first president of the United States will be General George Washington. Aye. Right. He'll waste no time making himself into a monarch. Do you think that General Washington, if elected, will establish a monarchy? Aye. Right. There'll be nothing in the Constitution to stop him if he's a mind to. And I reckon he'll have a mind to. Power would be spoiling a man, say I. Mr. Holloway has just been interrupted by a well-dressed man in the crowd. Would you have a mind to be Gentlemen, gentlemen, just a moment. Sir, we'll be glad to have your opinions on General Washington and the Constitution after Mr. Holloway is finished. Now, Mr. Holloway, Mr. Holloway, you were just saying General Washington will make himself king if the Constitution is ratified. Aye, and he could do it. According to the Constitution, the president would have his own standing army. Yes, but wouldn't the army be subject to the decisions of the federal Congress? With a gun at its throat, what could the Congress do? He'll be making himself monarch, Congress or no. Thank you, Mr. Holloway. Now, sir, now you have your opportunity. You tell you now, he's an empty head, that. Empty head, I would tell you, see, abuse, canard, that's the way with you rascals. Rascals. You impute the most savage to the patriots who bring the Constitution. You, you don't want the truth. Don't want the truth. You're a good writer, troublemaker, that's what you are. There's come in the back one. See, hold in your tongue now, you're fighting that empty head. Don't worry, please, please, gentlemen. We were discussing something else. Let's get back to the Constitution. Yes, indeed, the Constitution. I predict, sir, that unless the Constitution is ratified, the merchants of this country will be ruined, yeah. wiped out utterly. Are you a merchant, sir? Yes, sir, I am. I, uh, I am a merchant, sir. I trade in tobacco, uh, fine Virginia leaf, sir. Ask anyone in Richmond, you will find that Ralph Barker handles only the best. And you feel that the Constitution, yes. if ratified, would be a boon to business? Absolutely, sir. Business is bad today, all oh, bad, very bad. Oh, and my father. warehouse is bursting with unsold tobacco. The, the, the country is in a depression. And it's because of the money situation. It's scandalous. Absolutely. Would you explain that, please, Mr. Uh, Barker? Yes, oh, you explain. I will if you would only give me a chance. My, my word, there, there are so many different kinds of money in circulation. It's like the man in The blooms, the stolies, gold, Johannes' English, French crowns, English guineas, Spanish dollars. But yes, and to cap it all, the states are issuing money that isn't worth the paper it's printed on. Now, now, how on earth can a merchant do business under such conditions? It must be difficult. Necessary. Difficult? Why, it's impossible. It's confusion compounded into an unholy mess. And you feel that the Constitution, if ratified, would restore order in interstate commerce and regulate the currency? Yes, sir, I do. Of course I do. The Constitution specifically... This is John Daly in Convention Hall. We have interrupted Ken Roberts because Governor Randolph has just come in. He entered by a side door to avoid the crowd outside. Now he is walking down the aisle, and the tension here is so thick one can literally feel it. Uh, Mr. Henry has just snubbed Governor Randolph, and the snub was unmistakable. His face pale, the governor has walked to his seat, sits down, 
shakes hands with Mr. Madison. Now the gavel sounds. Mr. Pendleton, president of the convention, is calling the delegates to order. The final debate will begin in a few moments. As you know, the resolution embodying the Constitution has already been debated clause by clause in the three weeks this convention has been in session. And now, Mr. Pendleton. ratifying convention is hereby declared to be officially convened. <clears throat> by previous agreement, the final speech in opposition to ratification will be made by Mr. Patrick Henry, and he will be followed by Mr. James Madison, who will speak in favor of ratification of the proposed federal constitution. I now recognize the first speaker, Mr. Henry. And Patrick Henry rises. Walking slowly up the aisle, uh, he's moving toward the front of the hall. Now he's mounting the rostrum. His hawk-like eyes under that ragged wig look out piercingly around the room. And they have come to rest on Governor Randolph. Uh, Mr. Henry stares at the governor now with an expression of, well, you might almost call it contempt. And now Mr. Mr. Henry's about to speak. My concluding remarks in behalf of the anti-Constitution Party... The party of liberty will be brief. But I would first make a few observations on the conduct of one of the delegates. I am referring to none other than Governor Edmund Randolph. Last year in Philadelphia, Governor Randolph denounced the Constitution. It seems to me very strange that that which was then the subject of his denunciation should today become the object of his praise. Something extraordinary must have happened to operate so great a change in his opinion. Mr. President! Mr. President! Governor Randolph is calling for the floor. He's been ruled out of order. Now, Mr. Henry. I yield to the member. Let us hear what the honorable member has to say. The honorable speaker hints that I have changed my opinions for some hidden and therefore discreditable reason. I have no personal intention of offending anyone. I merely do my duty. The gentleman smiles when he says that. His conduct is malicious. And it is not compatible with the least shadow of friendship. Very well. If our friendship was fall, let it fall like Lucifer. Never to rise again. Does the member accuse me of malicious behavior? I believe the meaning of my words is clear. Is the member prepared to back up his remarks with D? If the gentleman seeks satisfaction, he will find my second place. I thank the gentleman for his willingness to render satisfaction. Mr. President, I address a short recess in order to erase the details of a matter of honor. I, I, this is unprecedented. <clears throat> However, due to... Uh, the member's request is granted, I hereby declare, a five-minute recess. <laughs> Mr. Randolph and Mr. Henry are leaving the hall, no doubt to choose and confer with their seconds as is traditional in these affairs of honor among gentlemen. This is a startling turn of events, and we'll try and bring you the development just as fast as we can. The floor here is a scene of confusion. The delegates are milling about, shouting and arguing, shaking their fists at each other, and... From the look of things here, it would almost seem that there'll be more affairs of honor out there on the floor of this convention hall, unless this convention is called back into order, and very soon, and there's Mr. Pendleton, Mr. Pendleton, sir, uh, will the session resume in spite of this conflict between uh, Mr. Henry and Mr. Randolph? Yes, I will reconvene in five minutes. And the vote will be taken as scheduled, sir? Uh, Do you have anything to say on that? Now, not now, please. All right, thank, thank you, Mr. Pendleton. The debate will continue. The vote will be taken despite this dramatic interruption. As you know, Mr. Henry is one of the principal speakers, and he must be back before the convention can properly be reconvened. As I said before, the floor is a scene of confusion, and there is a chance there will be more of these affairs of honor unless the convention is indeed called back into session and very soon. But now I've seen Ned Kelmer out there circulating quickly among the delegates to learn how Mr. Henry's attack on Governor Randolph will affect the vote. So let's go over to our CBS headquarters booth and Ned Kalman. Well, on the basis of my brief conversations with the delegates just now, it's safe to say that Mr. Henry, by his open attack on Mr. Randolph, has restored the situation to what it was before the governor came out in favor of the Constitution. Yes, I'd say there's no doubt about that. 
The delegates from the rural district admire forceful speech and prompt action. They saw it today. And no matter what outsiders may think of Mr. Henry's conduct, well, his action sits well with the country people. These uh, rural delegates who might have been shaken by Governor Randolph's new allegiance to the Federalists now seem to be back in the anti-Constitution fold definitely. And it does look as if the Constitution may fail of ratification. And we... Now Mr. Pendleton has called the convention to order again, so back to John Daly on the convention floor. The Republic itself... The delegates are again seated. The convention has reconvened and Mr. Henry has resumed the floor and is speaking on the resolution embodying the proposed federal constitution of the United States of America. Now let's listen to Mr. Patrick Henry. ...exclusion of the four remaining states. Congress under this proposed constitution would have a tyrant's power and more. It could lay whatever taxes it chooses. With a standing army, it could keep the people in submission. The president, if he should be ruthless and able could make himself an absolute ruler. I would rather have a king, lords, and a house of commons than a government complete with such insupportable evil. Gentlemen, my opponents ask you to surrender not only the sword and the purse, but the very scales of justice. Ratify this constitution, and you place our state courts at the mercy of federal courts. A monstrous creation. I dread popular resistance to this proposed government. So vague, so indefinite, so ambiguous in its assurances of liberty and human rights. Let me warn you in the most emphatic terms of the dreadful effects which must ensue should the people resist. I beg, I beseech the delegates to search their consciences and vote nay, nay on this resolution, lest they rouse the people to rebellion. In defense of their God-given liberties. Mr. Henry has left the rostrum, and Mr. Madison is coming up now to speak. He carries his hat in his hand. Now he's taking some slips of paper out of the hat. They are the notes for his address, and he's waiting for the convention to come to order. Order. The chair recognizes Mr. James Madison. Mr. President, fellow delegates, I yield to no man in my respect for the previous speaker. Yet in these brief concluding remarks, I would point out that his objections to the Constitution arise out of misunderstanding. This is not strange because the form of government we are proposing is new, unique, in the history of the world. Let the delegate, therefore, not measure it by outmoded standards. Mr. President, the American states have stirred the admiration of the world by setting up free governments under the pressure of war. How much more will they win admiration if they should be able peaceably to establish one central government when not cemented by common danger. But will the states achieve that goal? Suppose only eight states ratify and Virginia refuses to become the ninth except on her own terms. Then even if the others agree to our terms, which is doubtful, every state must call new conventions to consider the amendments. There will be endless disagreements Every state will be encouraged to offer its own amendment. Agreement will be even more difficult to reach than it was in Philadelphia. In short, Mr. President, if Virginia holds out today, the United States may never have a functioning central government. But if Virginia ratifies the Constitution, it may bring the most fortunate event in the history of mankind. I therefore respectfully submit that the honorable delegates vote yea on the resolution before us, the resolution containing the Constitution of the United States of America. <laughs> Mr. Madison replaces his notes in his hat and leaves the rostrum and from the floor many voices calling the question. Mr. Pendleton is raising his gavel. The convention will now...
our vote on the resolution embodying the proposed Constitution for the United States of America. The vote will be by a show of hands. A simple majority will decide. Those delegates who are in favor, those who wish to vote aye on the proposition, will raise their right hand. Hands are going up all over the hall, and the tellers are moving about counting. A total of 166 votes will be cast. 84 are necessary to carry or defeat the resolution. And it seems now as if half the number of delegates here have their hands up, but it's impossible to tell exactly... However, it's going to be close. You can be sure of that. Very close. We'll know the result in a moment from the eye count. If it's 84 or over, the eyes will have it, and the Constitution will be ratified here in the Virginia Convention and will become the law of the land. The tellers have completed their count now and are moving up to report to the rostrum. They're at the rostrum. Mr. Pendleton is receiving their reports, checking the totals, and we'll know in a moment. Uh, Mr. Pendleton. The tellers report... In favor of the resolution, 89 votes. The resolution is carried. Carried by 89 votes. Five votes more than necessary. The United States is now committed to a strong central government. We will have a president, a congress, a federal judiciary, a national army under the Constitution. I have a copy here in my hand, and it's clear to begin. We, the people of the United States, in order June 25th. to... June 25th. 1788, Virginia ratifies the Constitution and government of, by, and for the people begins. The ratification of the Constitution was another broadcast in the series You Are There, produced and directed by Robert Louis Sheehan. The program was written by Michael Sklar. Thomas Chalmers played Patrick Henry, Richard Waring was James Madison, Eric Dressler played Governor Randolph, and the cast included Carl Swenson, Chester Stratton, Bernard Lenro, Guy Sorrell, and others. Footnote. The Virginia Convention debated and voted under the impression that it was the ninth necessary ratifying state. The ninth necessary state was actually New Hampshire. It had ratified four days earlier. Mr. Madison, Mr. Henry, and their colleagues did not know this, because in those days news traveled slowly. Beginning next week, You Are There will be broadcast regularly over most of these stations at a new time, 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for You Are There next week and thereafter. Next week, November 7th, 1637, Puritan, New England. The trial of Anne Hutchinson. You are there. This is CBS, where 99 million people gather every week, the Columbia Broadcasting System.